Hello everyone. I know this is a bit different format than most of the videos on here, but uh, unfortunately one of our recordings for one of the lessons uh, was somehow corrupted. The file was corrupted, nobody's fault uh, or anything like that. It's just some, some kind of glitch with the camera. Um, but the lesson that uh, was not able to be recorded uh, was covering Christians and modern Israel. And because of how relevant that topic is, uh, just given the situation today and everything that's going on, I did want to uh, just record a brief kind of uh, summary of some of the points we talked about, um, just so that we can uh, keep in mind what scripture says as we are trying to wade through these kinds of topics. So I'm just going to go over some of the highlights here. I'm not going to re-preach the whole sermon or anything, but I just wanted to help us think about uh, some of these issues related to uh, Christians and the Bible and the issues uh, in modern Israel. Uh, most of us are probably aware of the attacks by Hamas on the uh, country of Israel about two weeks ago, a little over two weeks ago now. Uh, Hamas uh, went into uh, mostly civilian areas uh, across the uh, border from Gaza. They killed uh, probably over a thousand civilians based on the latest estimates and uh, uh, took some hostages, all sorts of things. Uh, the Israelis eventually pushed them back. The military was able to push those individuals back. And then uh, the Israelis have begun uh, sending rockets and uh, all sorts of uh, uh, preliminary strikes into Gaza, which is an area that uh, has about 2 million people, uh, civilians, not, uh, not just militants. And um, they are now uh, preparing for a ground assault, all of which has also resulted in thousands of uh, civilian deaths. And in all of this uh, that's going on, there has been a lot of a lot of responses given by Christians. And so uh, it's important for us, as we think about this, uh, not just from a political standpoint, I hope, uh, but as Christians from a Christian, from a biblical standpoint, it's important for us to uh, remember how uh, scripture addresses things like this uh, and to address some of the common misconceptions. So the first thing I want us to remember uh, as we are thinking about this is that while in the Old Testament during that time period the Jewish people, the uh, those of uh, the bloodline of Israel were called to be God's chosen people, that's no longer the case. The Jews are not God's chosen people today. Now, let's be very clear. We're not saying they aren't special to God. They're special to God in the way that every single human being is special to God. God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. But uh, the simple fact is that, uh, as Peter says in Acts chapter 4, uh, there is one name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. That is the name of Christ. And all who obey Christ, they are the ones who are God's chosen people. Uh, Peter continues to uh, address this in his epistles. Paul continues to address this in his epistles. Uh, in fact, in Romans, Paul will say that uh, the one who is a Jew under the new law is not one who is one outwardly. In other words, one who is a Jew physically by their bloodline, by their ethnicity. Uh, but one is a Jew who is one inwardly. Uh, and that is uh, the point uh, that he is trying to make is that ultimately uh, God's chosen people are those who obey his covenant not the old covenant of Moses, which was nailed to the cross, but the new covenant under Christ. So as we are dealing with all of these issues, we need to remember uh, the Jews are human beings, just like everyone else. They do not have some kind of privileged position simply because of their ethnicity uh, before God. But we also need to remember that Israel has no biblical claim to the land that they now occupy. Now, please don't misunderstand me we can have a whole discussion about whether or not they have a political right to that land. That's a whole nother discussion. All we're trying to point out here is that, biblically speaking, Israel does not have a right to that land from God. Now, they used to. That's certainly true. In, in Genesis, rather, chapter 12 and later in chapter 15, God very explicitly tells Abraham that his descendants will occupy the land of Canaan. And as we see time go on, the exodus occurs, and uh, Joshua eventually leads Israel into Canaan, and they take the land according to the promise. But the thing is, at the end of Joshua, we're told Israel takes possession of the land. That promise is fulfilled. And even later on, uh, with the kings, David and Solomon in particular, uh, they complete uh, the 
expansion of the land to the limits that God established in his promise. But that promise was always conditional. If you go back to Deuteronomy, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, we're told uh, that, uh, or rather God uh, tells Israel, if your heart turns away, if you stop following my commandments, you won't stay in this land. This land won't be yours forever. There is a condition. And unfortunately, as we read through the rest of the Old Testament, we see that Israel did just that. They did not remain faithful to God. The Assyrians eventually took uh, the northern kingdom of Israel out of their land. The uh, Babylonians took the southern kingdom out of their land. There was a remnant that returned, but uh, eventually, even with the destruction of Jerusalem and so forth, there, uh, there were no longer uh, Israelites controlling the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, as we sometimes call it. In fact, until about uh, 100 or so years ago, there were only about... 3% of the total population of that land that was of Jewish descent. God did not promise the land of Israel, the physical land of Israel, to the Jewish people forever. In fact, in Hebrews, we're told that that land, that physical land, was meant to get even the Jews, and certainly Christians, to begin thinking about the spiritual, the rest, the, the promised land, if you will, spiritually about heaven, the time when we will restore our fellowship with God in heaven. But thirdly, the Bible does not prophesy about modern Israel. There are a lot, a lot of explanations of prophecies, especially in places like Daniel and Ezekiel and Revelation, uh, where people try and fit modern history and modern events into the prophecies of Scripture. Uh, while we could spend a lot of time talking about that, the fact is that's not the case. Uh, when you look closely at the prophecies that are given, what we see is that the tangible prophecies, meaning the ones that are about actual lands and nations and kingdoms, those have been fulfilled already. What we see that has not been fulfilled yet our prophecies related to the second coming of Christ. But even that, those are not concerned with physical land. Uh, there are statements about things like the New Jerusalem, for example, in Revelation, which, by the way, uh, if you are watching this channel, uh, I hope that you will be uh, watching our classes on Revelation. We're going to get to some of those discussions as we move through the book of Revelation about what the New Jerusalem and things like that are actually referring to. But the point is, all of those those symbols, all of those descriptions, they are using the physical promised land, the physical temple that once existed, the physical city of Jerusalem. They're using those to convey something spiritual. Even the, again, going back to Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews tells us all of these things were shadows. All of these things were, were types or, or foreshadowing. You think about a really good book, right, that has foreshadowing for the characters and the plot. That's what that was. That was foreshadowing of a spiritual reality, which we, if we follow God through Christ, we will be able to take part in. Uh, we're told very specifically that we are looking for a heavenly Jerusalem, not one here on this earth. So uh, scripture simply does not uh, prophesy about modern Israel, and Christians should feel no obligation to uh, push for the Jews to take back the physical land of modern Israel as if that's somehow a fulfillment of prophecy. That's simply not the case. Uh, but I want to close uh, with uh, the fourth point, uh, not so much from a biblical standpoint specifically about the land of Israel and so forth, uh, but just about the nature of this conflict. Whenever there's any kind of conflict, whether it's in a relationship or whether it's two countries going to war, we naturally want to see uh, who is the good guy and who is the bad guy. But the problem is, that's not always the situation. Sometimes there is not a good guy in a conflict. There are many conflicts, there have been many wars, where there are only two bad guys. Now, I'm not trying to definitively say there are no good guys in this conflict. That's a whole other discussion that we can have. What I am trying to say is that just because we know one side is bad, I, I think I can be uh, very uh, explicit in saying anyone who targets civilians intentionally is the bad guy. 
But haven't both sides been doing that in this conflict? I would argue they have. If you look at uh, the uh, press releases, the tactics used by both sides in this particular conflict, both sides have been, at the very least, indiscriminately uh, launching attacks that they know very well are hurting civilians, and they are not trying to change their tactics. I just don't want us as Christians, and I think scripture can back us up on this, I don't want us to jump on a bandwagon because of politics and forget the fact that sometimes there's not a good guy in these kind of situations. Those who shed innocent blood were told in Proverbs, God says that's something that he hates. He hates those who shed innocent blood. And if both sides are shedding innocent blood, which it seems that they are, that should give us pause before we jump on a political bandwagon as Christians. We need to remember what God teaches about how we should handle these things. I'm not saying there's any kind of simple solution. I'm not saying if uh, Israel or Hamas or the Palestinians or uh, whoever, I'm not saying if someone were to just turn the other cheek, that would be it. It is a complex situation. There's a lot of politics involved. All I'm urging Christians to do is remember, remember what Jesus taught us. Remember that innocent life, that's the side we should be on. That's who we should root for. Those are the good guys. There may not be a good guy in terms of nation fighting against nation. We can't, fi we can't uh, find ourselves twisting God's word just to fit our political views. So I hope that is helpful. I'm sorry that the video uh, did not record properly for whatever reason, but uh, it seems to be working now. So uh, I just hope that this has been a, a helpful summary of some things we talked about, and this will be useful to us uh, in responding to this as Christians, uh, as we should respond to everything. Thank you so much.